and people in any case can join us as we go. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to the ninth episode in a series of webinars showcasing uh, the use cases and benefits of Copernicus, the Earth Observation component of the EU Space Program. My name is Sofia Odero I'm part of the Copernicus Support Office and I'll be your moderator today. This ninth webinar looks at how Copernicus data can be used to support Arctic prosperity and stability. I should mention that this webinar is being recorded and we will share it on the Copernicus EU YouTube channel. Now, to make the webinar more interactive, we will be using Slido for live questions. Uh, if you have downloaded uh, WebEx, you will find Slido on the right hand side of your screen in the Apps tab. Uh, if you're joining us directly from your browser, you can uh, access Slido using the link that we will share on the chat in a second. And uh, you may respond uh, to the questions that pop up on Slido as we go. Also, you may ask a question based on the content presented today, so feel free to type in your questions so that we may answer them during the Q&A session after each one of the presentations. So, since I mentioned Slido, uh, we've already uh, put the first uh, question out there as an initial icebreaker, and we would like to ask you, how would you rate your knowledge about Copernicus? So, to begin with, let's go through the agenda for today. Uh, we will have uh, two presentations from experts in the field, uh, Muriel Lux from uh, Mercator o Ocean International and Sridhar Jawak uh, from the Svalbard Integrated Arctic Earth, Observa Earth Observing System Knowledge Center. Um, following each of the presentations, we will open the floor to you, the audience, to ask any questions that you may have. So please feel free to type, uh, to type in your questions on Slido. Now, Let's go to our first speaker for uh, today, uh, which is uh, Muriel Lux. Uh, Muriel holds a PhD in physical oceanography. She works at Mercator Ocean International as an environmental policy and major account manager. In the context of European policies, her mission consists of maintaining a strong relationship with international organizations linked to ocean governance, to collect and understand needs, and to influence the evolution of the, the services offered by Mercator Ocean International and the Copernicus Marine Service. Um, Muriel, um, if you can unmute yourself, the, the floor is all yours. I don't know if if you're there. Muriel, can you hear us? I apologize for the delay. We've been having some issues with uh, Muriel's connection. Muriel? Mm, she cannot admit hers. Can you unmute yourself now? Because I see in the chat that you can't. Muriel, do you do you see the option to unmute? Okay. If it's okay with everyone, uh, maybe we can start with our second presentation, and in the meantime, we can work offline with Muriel so that we so that she can present her so that she can give her presentation. Okay, I apologize for the <laughs> for the technical issues. Um, in that case, then <laughs> I introduce our second speaker, uh, Sridhar Jawak. Uh, Sridhar holds a PhD in geoinformatics. He's a senior advisor 
on Earth observation and remote sensing at SEOS, the Svalbard Integrated Arctic Earth Observing System in Norway. Uh, Shridhar leads the remote sensing services uh, at SEOS to build an observing system in Svalbard. Uh, before joining SEOS, he was a project scientist at the National Center for Polar and Ocean Research in India, where he was involved in Earth observation and remote sensing activities in polar science, particularly focusing on Antarctica, the Himalayas and the Arctic. Uh, Sridhar, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Sophia. Uh, let me share my screen. The full screen mode. Okay, I think I'm audible and the screen is on. Can you confirm? Yes, we can see your okay. screen. Yes, thank you so much again for this uh, invitation to speak on this webinar. So my name is Sridhar, as introduced, and I will be speaking on Earth observation and remote sensing activities and opportunities for the Arctic science community through SIOS. So before, before beginning uh, the remote sensing activities, I would speak a little bit on what SIOS exactly is. So SIOS is several things, but I would focus on four important things. First is it's a consortium of 28 institutions from 10 countries. And you can see this uh, on the on the screen, but it is also an observing system for Earth system science, considering all spheres and focusing on processes like environmental and climate change. <clears throat> and uh, it is also a re distributed research infrastructure with many different observation facilities, as shown on the screen. But the last and the fourth, the most important is that we are the northernmost Copernicus relays on the planet. And our role is to promote the EU Copernicus program and satellite data sets and information. So as I shown uh, the 10 countries and uh, 28 institutions, these are the locus of the institutions and the countries which are involved in SIOS uh, as a member institutions of the consortium. But why, why, is, why Svalbard and what, are, what is our mission? So the Norwegian archipelago of Svalbard and surrounding waters is important because of the it's a high Arctic. Most severe temperature increases are found in Arctic. As you know, that Arctic is warming not three times, but four times uh, faster than the rest of the planet. And Svalbard is probably uh, uh, war one of the uh, rapidly warming places in the Arctic itself. Sorry. So, but uh, we also have a well-developed infrastructure in Svalbard for conducting research activities, such as we have flight connections, we have harbor activities, we have high data transfer rate or internet facilities. And the most important thing is that unique potential for the use of satellite data in attempts that uh, most of the polar orbiting satellite uh, overpasses, uh, either they have uh, they pass through the Svalbard or nearby uh, regions. So we have high overpass rate for satellite data sets. And uh, we already have the high quality research infrastructure developed with the international community with many research fields and the long history of the cooperation and coordination in research activities like uh, NISMAC, uh, the uh, Nielsen uh, Forum for the uh, Forum for this uh, for the science there. And the base on which science is created is the uh, the uh, the to utilize the already established infrastructure and to develop the new infrastructure where we can fill up the gaps. So our mission is to develop an observing system to share technology, knowledge, experience, and data, and close knowledge gaps, and finally decrease the environmental footprint of science. So how do we work? We work through different services, uh, science optimization, data management, remote sensing, training courses, communication and access and logistics to the research infrastructure. And the consortium members are involved through working groups and they have represented you on uh, these working activities. But I will focus more on the remote sensing and earth observation activities. <laughs> that is because this is the topic of interest for today. So our remote sensing service functions as a single point of contact for satellite information for Svalbard and gives assistance for access to remote sensing data. It also informs about the potential of satellite data and how to use these data sets. In, in our uh, mission, we aim to be a forum that brings together product users and providers in order to improve the usability of satellite data in 
collaboration. So SIOS works towards the integration of the new and existing research infrastructure on ground. As you can see the dotted uh, research infrastructures on the, on the ground, but also to integrate this ground infrastructure to the space-based in infrastructure like uh, satellite data to get the complete picture of Svalbard and fill the data gaps. So this is more in, important. Uh, this is the most important point to how we uh, how we are interested in integration and uh, supporting the Kalval activities in Svalbard. So, so as I mentioned, Svalbard has the best infrastructure of all high Arctic sites. This makes it ideal for calibration and validation. New instrumentation can must take into account uh, account of this. And as you know, that satellite owners need the best Calval activities to create the best measurements to justify the large investments. And uh, the other thing, other other way, SIOS works towards planning, collaboration, and integration of facilitating the dialogue for calibration and validation. One of such example is that here you can see on the slide uh, the the red dots where the water samples were collected to estimate the chlorophyll and on the background is the copernicus derived chlorophyll content on the uh, which can be used for uh, by the field scientists to get the complete picture of the chlorophyll distribution in kongsfjord so remote sensing service uh, deals with many activities but i will focus on some of the activities and tools from which are useful for the uh, arctic scientists or the researchers who are active in um, specifically in, not only in svalbard but also in other parts of the arctic and cryosphere regions so the first important is that uh, we provide three tools uh, sentinel acquisition plan that gives the detailed information about the planned sentinel 2 acquisition within the sios area of interest like Svalbard and associated waters. And then we also provide <coughs> Mosaic tool, an overview of the available products of last three days of Sentinel-2 products, Sentinel products. And the third tool, we provide the Sentinel-2 product comparison. Uh, it does what it says on the tin, allows the user to compare two Sentinel products, Sentinel-2 products for a selected tile. So these tools are useful, extremely useful for field scientists who are coming to Svalbard for field work, and they can use these tools on the on the website, SIOS website, and use this before the field work, during the field work, and also uh, plan their field work very well before and make uh, make sure that what kind of data set the data sets they are going to get uh, when they are on the field. But during the pandemic time, we also facilitated the dialogue, uh, how to patch up the field data gaps because the most of the scientists couldn't reach Svalbard due, due to the travel restrictions during the pandemic times. And in such a cases, we supported scientists by providing what kind of satellite data they can use to fill the gaps in the field data sets. So this is also this service we also kept open after the pandemic because this is something useful for those who are not expert in the remote sensing activities and they would like to use the satellite data. Recently, to facilitate this dialogue, we started the discussion forum, and uh, this will be launched very soon on the SIOS website, where users can put up their questions about the satellite data in Svalbard and what kind of ground infrastructure or the ground data set they, are, they, they would uh, be in SIOS has and what kind of satellite data they can use in their field work. And this service will be on very soon, uh, maybe before summer. <laughs> We are also involved in airborne remote sensing campaigns. We have, uh, uh, we have, we are coordinating with the uh, our member institution North and the local uh, company Luft Transport, who has the uh, Dornier aircraft, which is always stationed in Longyearbyen, and that is used for acquiring the hyperspectral and uh, optical data sets in Svalbard. So in two last two years, uh, 2020 and 21, during the pandemic times, we supported around 25 projects to collect the data. So that makes this all but one of the hyperspectral rich data set. And that is that might be something useful for calibration and validation of upcoming missions such as uh, Chime and uh, other hyperspectral missions. <laughs> We are also in the process of developing the SIOS unified platform for satellite data that provides the overview of the what kind of satellite data is available for Svalbard researchers. This will be more of the resource which will be available on the SIOS website. And that will uh, eventually improve the accessibility of satellite data over Svalbard. We also have the Svalbard specific SIOS webinar series where we, uh, we focus on mostly Earth observation and remote sensing activities, uh, webinars and specific topics where the remote sensing data is used by the community and the scientists. And uh, the next webinar, we are focusing on how citizen science can be used for the calibration and validation of satellite data. And this is, uh, this will, this is on the 
12th of May uh, during the uh, 10 to 11th summer time, in uh, European summer time, and more information you can get it from the SIOS website. We also host the online conferences to bring together the product uh, developer and the users of the satellite data. So the most recent one was in 2022, where we have more than 300 registered participants and around, around 50 talks within three days and presentation from the 24 institutions around 10 countries. As I mentioned, uh, our most important role here is the uh, one of the Copernicus relays. This is the northernmost Copernicus relay on the planet and our uh, duty is to uh, promote the Copernicus program and how to use the satellite data. So since 2017, annually we conduct the training courses to train scientists how to use the satellite data from the Copernicus. And this is uh, something important because our target audience is not the experts, but the, the beginners who do not uh, uh, have expertise of remote sensing or satellite data, but would like to use the satellite data in their, into their research. So since 2017, we are conducting this training course. One of the example is that last year we conducted AI for Svalbard training course, where uh, satellite how satellite data can be used for AI application in Svalbard. We uh, generally receive around 40 applications, and some of the topics we got developed on uh, deep learning and machine learning applications. And as I mentioned, this year we will be focusing on how to use the drones in Svalbard and what are the regulations and how uh, how can be can be can be useful for your research in Svalbard. So the deadline for application is extended. It's by 30th of April. If some of you are interested, you can apply for this training, uh, interesting training course, which will happen in Longyearbyen. We also give the uh, opportunity to how to access the third party satellite data sets. Uh, in recent calls, we provided access to the planet data uh, through a dedicated project proposal call. And this is uh, around, we supported around 11 projects out of 25 uh, submitted projects. And the deadline is crossed, already crossed, but uh, we look forward to the results from this, uh, call, this, uh, this uh, pro project proposal call. We also collect the information about what kind of satellite data and why the, uh, you need satellite data from the user community in Svalbard. So here you can see that uh, uh, most of the scientists who would need satellite data is comes from this cryosphere region and around 42% need daily satellite data. So that's quite an uh, interesting figure to, uh, for Svalbard researcher. And they need data sets for the ground truthing for their or the validation purpose. Uh, mostly they collect the samples from the uh, from the ground and then they would like to validate uh, the satellite based products. And then also some of them would like to combine the satellite data with the ground data. And uh, most of them also interested in supporting the field campaigns using the satellite data sets. And as I mentioned, we are now focusing on uh, how to involve citizen science or community-based observations in uh, calibration and validation data sets. We are very new into this field. So we had a first scoping workshop in January this year, and uh, we will increase the awareness uh, based on the uh, this workshop and then increase the awareness be uh, between the Svalbard researchers and the uh, and the residents in Longyearbyen. To so uh, in this year, we expect to start a few pilot citizen science initiatives or activities. So uh, the, the first one is the webinar, which will be ho hosted next month. We also uh, ha have the projects uh, based on the e research infrastructure that can support Earth observation activities. For instance, the CRYOS, the Cryosphere Integrated Observatory Network, which is which started this year. This will give uh, more uh, opportunities for the calibration and validation. For example, we are going to install the corner reflectors in three sites in Svalbard. Also, uh, install some of the terrestrial cameras that can be used for the calibration and validation of optical data, such as terrestrial vegetation. Uh, similar project we had for uh, it's still going on like like four years now. We have around 11 projects supported by Norwegian Space Agency, and all are in relation to the EU's Copernicus program in a way that uh, we use, develop the satellite-based products, such as wind products and terrestrial vegetation in, in Svalbard. So these infrastructure projects will provide more uh, information that is derived from the satellite data, and that can complement the ground-based uh, research infrastructure data sets. We are also active on uh, 
uh, social media. If you would like to see the sat satellite data through Copernicus program, uh, we uh, we generally post it uh, image of the week, and then that you can act you can actually have a uh, if you if you follow us on Twitter, you can have a look on the what is the current situation of the uh, Svalbard uh, snow or the uh, the uh, the, uh, the data sets uh, that are acquired over the Svalbard. So in summary. Uh, there are many opportunities the the most important uh, the upcoming is the uab for svalbard that is uh, that is that will be hosted in uh, that will be conducted in first week of september but the deadline is 30th of april the webinar series the the, the next webinar is on next week uh, the next month 12th of may uh, we are also a co-organizer of the esa workshop that is a cesa that will be hosted in the first week of may that in the longibian and as I speak, uh, we also have a session in Vienna going on uh, in Austria for the uh, on the airborne measurements in uh, in Arctic and airborne measurements over the Europe. So if you if you are also interested in uh, presenting your research in Svalbard uh, using remote sensing data, you can also participate in our online conference. With this uh, short presentation, uh, I'm happy to answer some of the questions you have and. Uh, I hand over to Sophia. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And indeed, we open the floor to um, any questions that the audience may have. Uh, you can you can share your your questions on Slido or uh, on the chat, or if you want to make it more interactive and you want to raise your hand and ask your question directly, feel free to do so. Um, in the meantime, I have, um, I have one question, which is, <clears throat> so what what are the main challenges that you face uh, when acquiring all the all the data that, that you gather? Uh, you, you mean the ground based data set or the satellite based data sets? Actually, both. OK, uh, so the ground, for the ground based data sets or the research infrastructure based in situ data sets, uh, the data management is the challenge because uh, not all the scientists are trained in managing the data. So making the NetCDF file or the make, making the data available through fair principles is, a, is still a challenge in scientific community. So we, uh, we, we generally host training courses uh, to, de to develop this expertise in scientists so that they can manage their data set well and that can be make it available through SIOS data access point. So that's uh, one thing. And, uh, for the Copernicus data sets, we don't have much challenges. I think we use the Norwegian ground segment uh, for making it available for this uh, data through Copernicus, at least Sentinel-1 and 2 for the, so over the Svalbard region. So we don't have uh, specific challenges there. That's, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, and uh, you mentioned also that, of course, um, since, since you're a Copernicus relay, part of your um one of your objectives of course is to um to be like a liaison between experts and copernicus but also the general public and copernicus and you mentioned that you're organizing some uh citizen science um activities one of them i believe is the the webinars uh, but you mentioned that you're organizing other activities could you give us a, a flavor of what's coming up <clears throat> Yeah, uh, we 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 try to actually reach to the uh, the the uh, audience, which is big, which is in the beginners level of uh, using the satellite data. For instance, uh, the scientists who are visiting Svalbard, they uh, they have a variety degrees of various degrees of understanding of satellite data. So we train them using the training courses. So our training courses are very special. Where we specifically mention that we. We expect those who do not uh, use uh, remote sensing data, but would like to use the remote sensing data, and we train the scientists to use uh, to e e increase the uptake of the satellite data, mostly Copernicus program. And also, we host the webinar series so that uh, uh, the Svalbard researchers can know that how what kind of applications are possible using satellite data sets. This is what this is. These are the regular uh, programs, but. Uh, annually, we also host the uh, online conference, which is which is quite big, like three days long and half days long, and uh, we have experts from inter international experts and in different countries, and they can they uh, they present their studies on Arctic uh, using satellite data sets, so that they can, we can reach to the wider audience how applicability of the satellite data in Arctic can be explained. 
And citizen science, we are quite new into this field. We recently started uh, the citizen science. Uh, we had a one workshop there, and uh, there we gathered information about what kind of uh, citizen science uh, projects they would like to see in Svalbard. And the next step is to reach out to the residents here who would like to use, who would like to uh, contribute into such kind of efforts, and then we start the mutual dialogue between the researchers and the residents so that uh, we can collect some kind of data that is useful for both for calibration of validation of satellite data, but also uh, their own research. Not only we, we, we are actually open at the moment. So uh, there are many ideas coming up, but the real uh, activities will start early next year. That's great to hear, and we encourage everyone to to stay tuned for the new activities that you're planning and to follow uh, your social media account also for the amazing pictures that you share there. Um, so once again, thank you so much for your presentation today. And we will now go to our second presentation of the day. But before we do, let me sh share another question on Slido. Uh, we are actually curious to know if this is the first uh, Copernicus webinar that you attend. You should now see the the Slido question on. And Muriel, are you there? Can you can you join us now? Yes. Perfect. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> Otherwise, I was gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> and I think I can uh, so... share my screen as well. <laughs> Yes, but let me introduce you first now properly. Uh, so here today we have uh, Muriel Lux. Muriel holds her PhD in physical oceanography. She works at Mercator Ocean International as an environmental policy and major account manager. In the context of European policies, her mission consists of maintaining a strong relationship with international organizations linked to ocean governance to collect and understand needs and to influence the evolution of the services offered by uh, Mercator Ocean International and the Copernicus Marine Service. Uh, Muriel, the floor is all yours. We can. We are not seeing the presentation, although on uh, full screen, we see okay. your PowerPoint. You see my PowerPoint? Oh yes, but I can. Uh, yes, but full screen. Yeah. Is it okay? Now we see. Uh, wait, we are seeing the the presenter mode. You have to change uh, screen yes. probably. Yes. Is that okay? Uh, no, we still see the, the presenter screen. Oh, wait, okay. It's very uh, heavy today. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. At least we can see you and hear you. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I have to change, but I haven't the link again. Uh... Don't move. <laughs> Perfect. Now we see it in full screen. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, let's go. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the Copernicus Marine Service for the Arctic. I've prepared a very uh, generic and uh, um, practical uh, presentation to uh, make some. Uh, New users may be uh, uh, discover this uh, this uh, web service. Well, first of all, uh, I will uh, show you how to reach the marine portal, uh, and I will present the Copernicus Marine uh, offer in a nutshell. How to reach the marine data store and the ocean monitoring indicators we have for the Arctic Ocean, and I will present. Uh, our web page dedicated to, to the use cases uh, and our visualization tool. So let's start. So um, as an introduction, what, what I can say is that uh, Mercator Ocean International and the Copernicus Marine Service aim at better serving your current directive and policies. Uh, this includes uh, the EU Arctic policies uh, uh, that are based on the three pillars. Uh, it supports the inclusive and sustainability of the development in Arctic regions. It addresses the ecological, social, economic, and political challenges related to climate change and take actions to protect the Arctic environment. This includes uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, parameters. And it also contributes to peace and dialogue. 
So the Copernicus Marine Service provides ocean information that would help to support and anticipate the needed action. Uh, how to reach the marine portal? It's uh, quite simple. There is a, a single access point, uh, which is uh, reachable at uh, marine.copernicus.eu. Uh, on this landing page, you can reach the, the data with the ocean product uh, uh, panel here. Uh, our annual ocean state report uh, regarding the ocean health and the, the ocean climate. We have also some ocean monitoring indicators that are very uh, useful to have a kind of integrated uh, global uh, uh, view of the trends uh, in the ocean uh, during the last decades. And we have uh, several ocean uh, visualization tools uh, that are very useful to discover or handle the, the, the data and the products. This uh, online data store includes more than 300 scientifically qualified products. They are all delivered in a common format, NetCDF. They are all open and free uh, for uh, anybody. Um, if we want to uh, quickly um, uh, uh, describe the, the, the Copernicus Marine offer, it includes different sources of data. We provide uh, satellite observation data as well as in situ observation data and model data that can uh, be uh, very useful if you have uh, to uh, anticipate uh, the, the ocean of, uh, of the days ahead. Uh, the satellite observation data we provide are only uh, level three and level four products. Uh, usually they are the daily, uh, they are graded products, but we have also uh, in the level three, some uh, uh, daily composite uh, products. All these uh, data sources uh, are uh, available under um, different shape and with different temporal coverage. We provide the reanalysis, what we call reanalysis. It's a long time series of uh, data information covering uh, up to 25 years for all the regions of, of the globe, uh, including the Arctic. We have real time information uh, with a daily or hourly uh, frequency. And we also provide with the model data uh, the forecasting information up to uh, 10 days ahead. Uh, the Copernicus Marine Service um, uh, has uh, several uh, regional uh, and uh, global um, uh, areas. Uh, Arctic is one of, of them, and we will see. Uh, uh, what it includes. Um, to go further in the different parameter we provide, we usually divide the, the, the ocean information we provide into uh, uh, three components, what we call the blue ocean, dealing with the uh, ocean dynamics, uh, the, the physics, the circulation, the temperature, the salinity of the ocean. We also have the green ocean uh, parameters uh, dealing with all the biogeochemical uh, uh, processes in the ocean. Uh, and we have some information regarding uh, the white ocean, uh, including uh, sea ice uh, uh, information, uh, especially. Uh, regarding the ice products, since uh, we talk about the Arctic, we have uh, 21 uh, ice products. Uh, these include uh, the sea ice concentration or sea ice thickness, sea ice drift, and many others. Uh, some are coming from uh, satellite observation, some others are coming from um, model or in situ data. And if you want to reach the, the product we have for the Arctic, it's quite simple. From the landing page, you have to click on ocean products to reach our uh, portfolio, our catalog. And then you are uh, here now uh, in the Copernicus Marine Data Store. And uh, with the, the left panel, you can uh, activate or disactivate some filters, such as the area. So here I've selected the Arctic Ocean, for example. And we can see uh, then that we uh, have uh, 47 uh, product dedicated to the Arctic. 
Uh, and if you, you can also uh, select um, the corresponding product, selecting a simple va variable, it could be uh, ice, it could be temperature, velocity, or whatever. If you click on, uh, on a product, you reach um, a product sheet explaining how uh, this product has been built uh, and from uh, which uh, producers. You can reach uh, the um, documentation of the product, including the quality information document. Uh, and you can uh, also access the data, uh, have different protocols to reach the data. And then if you click on the, um, on the map, just uh, um, near, near the, the, in the product sheet, you reach uh, directly uh, our uh, ocean viewer. And then it's uh, completely in interactive. You have uh, here the, the variable you have selected, the data set you have selected. Uh, you can add uh, other layer and make it uh, visible or, or not. Uh, and then if you uh, want to uh, know more about the product, you click on the, the I uh, for information. And then you have again this uh, product sheet giving some uh, uh, metadata concerning the, the product. Um, as I mentioned, the Ocean Viewer is completely uh, interactive. It means that if you click on the point of, of, of the map, you will uh, have some time series at the point of the, the, the parameter you have selected. Uh, and you can uh, change the position of the point to, to, to look at this uh, time series uh, uh, as uh, the, the, as uh, uh, what, what do you want? Um, another uh, another uh, interesting um, functionality of this viewer that is very useful even for beginners is that you can share uh, the image you have built or share the viewer you have built by clicking on this icon. Then you will have a link and if you send this link to another person, it will open this uh, exact um, uh, web page with the, the viewer and the layer you have selected. Moreover, if you want to embed uh, this uh, viewer and, and its functionalities into your web page, you have to uh, click on uh, embed in the share, uh, in the share uh, icon and it will provide you with the, the line to be uh, uh, added in your uh, HTML uh, uh, website uh, to have this viewer included in your pages. Very uh, uh, practical. This is another example with uh, some other uh, variables that we are providing for the Arctic. Uh, here, it, this is the, 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 CC, the significant wave 8. Uh, at that, the same way, you can have a different time series of the, the, the waves um, and can be useful uh, to, uh, to, um, to download uh, some information uh, over the past. But also, uh, since some of our products are uh, coming from a model, they provide forecast. And uh, even um, with the timeline, you can select the date to, for which you want to have the the C state, for example. Yeah, we also have some uh, project uh, for the biogeochemistry. Here we have the, the phytoplankton parameter uh, coming from um, um, the, a, a model, I guess. And the same in the same way, you can have the time series, the vertical profile, and the evolution of the vertical profile through, through the time at the point you have selected. Uh, now, I would like to talk about the ocean monitoring indicators uh, that are computed uh, in the frame of the Copernicus Marine Service. So, you can reach them by clicking on this uh, panel. And then, I've selected here some uh, indicators we have for the Arctic Ocean. Uh, you can um, uh, download the, the, this, um, these indicators or simply uh, having some information about them. This include, uh, for example, the trend in the sea ice extent during the last decades. Uh, you can have also some uh, um, visualization of 
how the, the seasonal cycle of the sea ice extent uh, over uh, the last uh, year uh, is uh, compared to the, the, the mean uh, 20 past years. Uh, there are several uh, very interesting uh, indicators uh, that are peer reviewed uh, by the scientific co communities, and uh, they are provided here. Very interesting to know. Um, we also ha have a, a web page uh, dedicated to uh, all the use cases uh, um, that have been uh, submitted to the Copernicus Marine Service and. Um, and, um, handling some uh, Copernicus uh, marine products. These use cases are reachable by, by clicking on the, the top bar menu. Uh, and then if you click on, uh, on each of uh, them, you can have a description of uh, the, the use case, what were the product used, uh, and so on. Uh, this, uh, for example, here I've selected as a keyword Arctic and uh, polar environment uh, monitoring, and and then the the selection of the corresponding use case is made. Um, what I would like to mention before uh, uh, going on with the use case is that we have also a, a, another um, a page dedicated to the users, the user corner. Uh, in these pages, you will find a lot of e-learning materials, uh, including some um, uh, Python code to, to uh, manipulate, to, to make some computation with the Copernicus Marine product, so it can be useful as well. Uh, to come back to the use case, uh, we have uh, uh, presently uh, 20 use cases dedicated to the Arctic Ocean. Uh, this use case have been uh, made for, uh, from uh, national institutes, uh, but it can be also private companies um, and uh, other uh, public um, bodies. Uh, they uh, address uh, different uh, domain of, of application, the safety, uh, the marine conservation, marine food, marine navigation. Uh, the science and climate and uh, polar environment monitoring and uh, society and education. All these use cases are reported into a use case book uh, uh, we have built uh, with them and uh, which is accessible through our website. Um, I just uh, showed you uh, our visualization tool, which is the very powerful in terms of functionality, but we have several visualization tools. The one I've showed uh, was the, the best one, uh, in my opinion, but we have also uh, uh, other very simpler visualization tools to uh, uh, discover uh, the ocean variables uh, or particular uh, ocean information um, for beginners or intermediate users. The one I've showed is much more uh, dedicated to people who want to compute or to, to, to download or to do something with the data. And uh, to if you only want to explore the portfolio of Copernicus uh, or to uh, make a training about a, a particular variables, the, the other one, the My Ocean Learn and Light, could be uh, quite sufficient to, to show that. Uh, I would like also to mention that uh, the DGDFIS uh, has uh, asked Mercator to launch, to implement a proof of concept of uh, Arctic uh, uh, thematic hub. This, uh, this uh, will be one of the Copernicus thematic hubs uh, that will be uh, uh, implemented in the following years. So we have the, the mission to uh, to implement this proof of concept of Arctic Hub, and this will be launched uh, in autumn uh, this year. Uh, and uh, these uh, hubs will include not only the marine, uh, the Copernicus marine product, but as well the other uh, Copernicus service uh, data, uh, meaning the, the land service, uh, the, and the, the atmosphere service, and the climate change uh, service. So uh, this uh, this hub will be powerful if you want to have not only marine information, but as well uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole package of the Copernicus that are available for a particular region. 
Well, that's it for me. Uh, we are reachable and we have a very uh, efficient and powerful uh, service desk. So if you uh, need uh, help or if you have any question, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam, for this very interesting talk. Uh, we now open the floor to uh, the audience for any questions that uh, you may have. And in the uh, in the meantime, um, I would like to to ask you myself a few questions, if if that's okay. Uh, although I see someone has raised their hand. Wait, uh, Fred, I see you raised your hand. Yes, indeed. Hello, Muriel. Nice to see you again. Um, you uh, you displayed a, an amazing list of, of use cases. I was wondering if um, these use cases have been developed, I would say, mainly for, uh, let's say, demonstration purposes, or if some of them um, uh, really correspond to operational services uh, which are currently used by, um, by different um, um, private or public um, um, entities. Yes, uh, I, I, uh, some of them are still uh, working, but uh, originally when we have asked for this uh, demonstration, uh, uh, we have uh, asked for uh, two years or three years, I don't remember, uh, uh, maintenance. Uh, and then some of them are not accessible now, but uh, they, are, they have been described. And maybe some of them have developed business uh, behind this demonstration. So uh, they are they are not uh, publicly uh, available uh, now all, but some of them uh, yes, um, and um, yes, that's my. Answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you for for the answer again. The if anybody has any questions, you can share them all on Slido or uh, on the chat. Um, I I actually have a, a question myself, um, which is which is related actually a bit with uh, with Frederick's uh, question uh, regarding the use cases, and I was wondering if there was any specific uh, use case that you would highlight, be it for its scientific relevance or the societal impact, or simply because personally you found it particularly interesting and. Hmm, I, I should have prepared this. <laughs> I should have uh, looked at the, the, the use case. Uh, we have many use cases. Uh, as I mentioned, there, there is a, uh, there, there is a, a set of 20 use cases. Um, I, I cannot say I remember every of, of the use case. Um, of what we are talking here about uh, stability and uh, prosperity. So I, I I maybe I would uh, be rather uh, uh, I would point out to the the ocean else one for the fisheries <laughs> and to to allow um, uh, a correct uh, uh, rate of fishing uh, in the Arctic um, and but uh, and regarding the navigation uh, I don't know if it's uh, the increase of navigation in the Arctic will be. A subject of uh, stability and um, and prosperity, and maybe not for the indi indigenous people. Um, but uh, yes, uh, we have uh, several use cases dealing not directly to these topics. Uh, sometimes it's, it's much more focused on the monitoring of a particular uh, variables or the 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 safety the safety of the navigation. Yes, we have. Uh, uh, many of them uh, dealing with the sea state and how and how uh, it, it can work uh, uh, in the future, but uh, no, I have no no preference. <laughs> depends. It depends on the sensitivity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Also, of course, it depends on the application that you want the the service for. So that that makes perfect sense. And also, in in relation to that, I was uh, wondering if you know. Uh, who are the main users of this uh, services focused on on the wide ocean? Is it researchers or? Um, hmm. um, yeah, it depends. Uh, last week uh, I was at uh, at a meeting of the Copernicus Security Service, and they have a lot of uh, a lot of interest in the the, the information we provide because. Uh, they need the, the, the best information for this uh, very uh, sensitive uh, 
uh, region. Uh, but uh, there is some research because in the Arctic, we still don't know uh, a lot of everything. Uh, we need to improve all the, the, the knowledge about the processes, the, 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 the dynamics uh, and uh, all the all the things that happen under the ice, the sea ice. Um, so I think that there is a lot of uh, scientists, but since we uh, hear about the Arctic more and more, I think that the general public is very uh, sensitive to the, 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 the sea ice extent that, that is uh, uh, the decreasing uh, the dramatically. And uh, I think that in, in this uh, kind of uh, uh, information, you can find different level of uh, information depending on what you are looking for. I think that the, the, the researchers, the scientists uh, uh, look at the satellite observation. They make a lot of uh, uh, very uh, complex computation. But finally, when we uh, want just simply to have a, a look at the temperature at the surface, or if we want to see uh, how, it, uh, how is the sea ice extent and thickness at the, at the moment or in the, the past, um, yeah. It's not so uh, difficult to understand. So I think that you can uh, find your, your what you you look for in uh, such portal. That's that's great to hear. Once again, thank you very much for your presentation and thank you for answering all of our questions. Sorry for uh, the beginning. <laughs> no, no, that's that's perfectly fine. Everything worked well, so no problem. Um, so we're reaching uh, the end of this ninth uh, Copernicus webinar. Uh, I, I want to thank again our speakers for such interesting and engaging presentations and thank you the audience for your participation and engagement. And we hope you learned something new today about how Copernicus can be used for supporting Arctic prosperity and stability. And now before you leave, uh, we would actually like to ask you um, for some feedback. Uh, so we would appreciate it if you could answer one final question on Slido, which is how useful have you found the content of this webinar? Uh, Muriel, by the way, you're still sharing your screen. <laughs> yes, I, I look for the uh, stop video, yes. <laughs> um, and now before also for everyone leaves, um, just to remind you that if you have any other questions or comments, uh, you can reach us through our online channels, which I invite you to follow in case you aren't already doing so. So stay up to date uh, so that you stay up to date with uh, Copernicus. Uh, thanks again uh, for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar and have a nice day. See you next time.